This is Aksaray, a neighborhood in Istanbul dubbed as Little Syria. It is the one area where you can find anything from Syrian bread to Syrian spices to espresso. And espresso here will set you back only 30 cents. And Aksaray is not alone. Right now you can find an espresso machine on almost every street in areas with significant Syrian populations. These espresso machines are not usually inside coffee shops, but are directly on the streets, sometimes even in front of small shops or markets. But the most interesting part is that this culture didn't exist just a couple years ago. Although Turkey has the second most Starbucks shops among European countries, and the cafe culture is extremely popular, Turkey doesn't really have a strong espresso culture. Drinking espresso without mixing it with anything is still kind of a niche thing. Now you might be thinking that, oh, the Syrians brought espresso culture to Turkey. But that's not true. At least not entirely. I don't remember I have ever seen an espresso machine in my village. Uh, I mean, you can, you, can, you can find it maybe in like uh, old Damascus uh, areas or like old Aleppo. And that happened very lately, actually. You can find it in cafes, for example, which is normal, I think. But it wasn't that popular. And the explanation is that this culture was not brought into Turkey, but it was born in Turkey. To understand why and how this culture was born, we have to look into two things, history and the refugee crisis. Most of you have probably heard about the origin story of coffee. The one with the Ethiopian goat herder, very excited goats, and the monk who disapproves and then changes his mind after smelling burnt coffee. Although we don't have much, if any, evidence to support this story, we know that coffee as a drink existed back in the 15th century. Until the mid-17th century, it was drank exclusively by the Muslims. By 1534, it has reached Damascus, and 20 years after that, it has reached the Ottoman Empire's capital, Istanbul. Two Syrians, one from Damascus, named Hakem, and the other one from Aleppo, named Shem, moved to the capital and opened the first coffee shops there. These shops were very successful and had laid the foundations of the coffee culture in Turkey, helping create what we call as Turkish coffee today. Although Syrians helped blooming the Turkish coffee culture, the Syrian coffee and the Turkish coffee are two very different drinks. Although there are more subtleties, this is where most of the differences end and the similarities begin. Both coffees are made using similar methods. You start with adding water to your jazve, then you add coffee to your jazve, you mix them together, you start heating them on a fire or nowadays on a stovetop, and then, when it boils, your coffee is ready. This whole process takes somewhere between 3 to 10 minutes and is usually enjoyed sitting and sipping with friends or family. It was traditional drink in coffee shops or served to the guests. It's definitely a social drink, which makes sense given it's also called the wine of Islam. There is also another traditional Syrian coffee drink called Murrah and it's even more ritualistic in its nature. Mura is usually boiled for somewhere between two to seven hours. After that, it's usually put in a jazve that's being warmed by some coals in it. You can think of the jazve as something like an ember mug, but it's a lot more basic and a lot larger. Mura is also traditional drink at homes, usually offered to guests, family or friends. Although this was an oversimplified summary of the origins of the coffee, the history of the Syrian coffee and the culture surrounding it, it should be enough to prepare you for what comes next. In 2010, a spark in Tunisia has changed the future of a whole geography. What started as protests quickly turned into uprisings in many countries. And in the case of Syria, it became a fully-fledged civil war. Many people fleeing from the horrors of the war took refuge in neighboring countries. Among these countries, Turkey saw the biggest influx of refugees. Between 2014 and 2016, the number of registered Syrian refugees rose by 2 million, which amounted to almost 10% of Syria's population before the war. And this was only the registered numbers. More than 2 million of these refugees 
live in only five cities. In Gaziantep, Hatay, and Urfa, the Syrian refugees make up more than one-fifth of the city's population. This influx of refugees has led to the creation of many Syrian ghettos. These ghettos are usually extremely crowded and very chaotic. The absence of infrastructure, the population density, and the overall bad economic situation all play a role in creating this very chaotic environment. The lack of local services and integration centers also further increases the social exclusion. Most of the businesses in these areas are owned by Syrians, meaning that day-to-day -day monetary transactions happen inside the Syrian community. Düşük paralarda çalışıyorlardı. Haliyle bundan memnun değillerdi. Zor oluyordu ki insanlar onlara horda davrandı çok fazla. Daha sonrasında kendi dükkanlarını açmaya başladılar. Yani bir Suriyeli Suriyeli berberine gider, bir Türk Türk berberine gider. Sistem bu şekilde. As Syrians moved to Turkey, they brought their own culture with them. And in the Syrian culture, coffee has a very important place. Well, Syrians, Syrians drink coffee mostly every day. For Syrians, it's so related to the culture. You know, like I'm sure that every Syrian around the world have a lot of memories, a lot, a lot of memories that's related to the uh, smell of coffee. From waking up in the morning, your dad is making boiled coffee, uh, the grandfather making mirror coffee, he wakes up at 5 a.m., roasting manually the coffee and grinding it and like cooking it for hours. They used in weddings, they use it in like funerals, they like friends gathering. All the time, everywhere, you will find one liter of Mira coffee on the table to be served for anyone, anytime. In 2012, one of the biggest Syrian coffee chains, Hacı Olabey, entered the Turkish market. Although they operate two coffee shops in Istanbul, their main business is importing and roasting coffee. They sell their whole bean coffees to more than 50 coffee shops, and they also sell ground coffee to make Syrian coffee at home. Although Hajolabi and other smaller coffee shops offer Syrian coffee for very low prices, it doesn't exactly fulfill the need for coffee for the refugees. The population density caused many people to live in very crowded houses. It's not rare to see 10 people living together in a very small apartment. That's the reason that most refugees spend their days outside of their homes, usually working or running errands like dealing with the Turkish bureaucracy, or even sometimes shopping. In a lifestyle like this, waiting for boiled coffee is a luxury of time. This is where espresso comes in. It takes no more than 30 seconds to pull a shot. Most of the Syrians coming to Turkey left all their belongings and life savings behind in Syria and came to Turkey with very low amounts of money. A second hand espresso machine usually doesn't cost too much. And you can sell it for almost the same price that you bought it for, making it a very low risk, but kind of low profit investment. Compare that to opening a restaurant or a shop, which requires a lot more risk taking, but is a bit more profitable. But that risk is usually too much for a refugee. And even for some refugees who took that risk, putting an espresso machine in front of their shops is a good investment because it's a steady income with low risk. That's the business side of the things, but another interesting aspect of this culture is the coffee itself. The espresso Syrians make are very different than the ones we are used to. Yes, that's instant coffee. Most espressos here are not tanned. So the extraction is very uneven and the body is like very weak. So to balance this out, people put instant coffee into their espressos. And as weird as it might look, 
it kind of sort of works. It, it gives a bit more body and makes it more like coffee. And some people put lots and lots of sugar and milk powder into their espressos. I mean, a lot. هلا هون لازم نلبي نحن كل الاذواق هون اسطنبول هلا هي القهوة اذواق القهوة اذواق القهوة كيف؟ Your personal taste probably plays the biggest role in shaping the way you drink your coffee but something else also plays a very major role and that is the culture you are surrounded in and your lifestyle The Syrian coffee culture has a history of hundreds and hundreds of years that goes hand in hand with the oral general Syrian culture But that culture was disrupted by the civil war and the following refugee crisis. But as life got faster, coffee also got faster. In fact, the fastest two ways of making coffee that I can think of are espresso and instant coffee. Similarly, as economic situations worsened, people came up with ways of making cheaper coffee. But the one thing that fascinates me the most about this whole new unique espresso culture is simply the fact that people just didn't give up on their coffee. They just adapted and found more suitable ways to make coffee and enjoy coffee. The current pandemic has affected all of us, but the refugee camps were hit the hardest. The NGOs working in the area are the only hope for many refugees. In the description box below, we will be putting some details about how you can help and donate to these NGOs. If you can afford to help, please consider it.